So I'd like to divide um, my comments uh, into uh, the original thoughts I had as one of the key authors of the seven solutions. And I want to be careful here. I'm speaking for myself, uh, not for TPPF uh, or not for anyone that tried to implement those. Uh, the seven solutions were originally came from my experience as a parent and a teacher for 21 years and having now served on various boards at the Harvard Business School for 21 years. So they were uh, an attempt to bring a more results-oriented, student-friendly focus uh, to education. They were seven ideas. Uh, they were presented several years ago at an open public meeting with a group of regents, uh, and since then have had a life of their own and have gotten kind of controversial. So what I'd like to do is comment on at least uh, my intent as one of the authors behind those without uh, in any way talking about what anyone else wanted to do with them. Uh, and then also my personal view of what happened, and then a discussion of the data that was unveiled, unveiled because I think at the end of the day, the data uh, that, that, uh, that this seven solutions fight uh, unveiled is uh, fascinating and deserves to be uh, studied uh, more and more by more scholars. So first to the seven solutions. Uh, again, the goal was to move to a more student-friendly, results-oriented uh, way to think about it. The seven solutions are actually really simple, and I don't think anybody's listened to them, so quickly I'll give you what they were. And by the way, there's two articles in the back, <clears throat> and I tried to represent the left and the right, even though we're at Cato. Uh, New Republic has a very uh, flattering article about how student-friendly and student-centric the, uh, the solutions were, and the National Review has a more recent article uh, on the same to topic. Uh, quoting from the National Review article, the seven solutions were in order. One, that we should just publish uh, student evaluations and other, facul other faculty information. In other words, how much does each faculty member get paid? How, much do they, how many students do they teach? Uh, how, much, how many research funds are brought in? Uh, and um, their grade evaluations, how many A's and B's they give in student evaluations. No comment made on how this should be used, just that it was in the sense of transparency it would be terrific uh, for taxpayers and parents and students to see. This, by the way, was the only one of the seven solutions that's happened and is the one that, for reasons I'll get into in a minute, created an enormous uproar. Uh, number two, in a teacher-student friendly way, that the best teachers should receive voluntary bonuses, so you can volunteer for a bonus, based on student evaluations and your efficiency. So if you were teaching well, and then you could teach more students, you would actually get a small bonus on top of how you were normally paid. A uh, third, and I think this was the most misunderstood, that research and academic budgets should be separated, not meaning you should have two separate faculty, but it would be nice to measure each separately uh, and see what faculty members were doing. And in fact, this is where the data uh, from the collected showed some very surprising things. Uh, fourth, faculty, some faculty, at least a few, should show some record that they could actually teach before getting tenure. Uh, having been on tenure, uh, involved in tenure decisions, uh, I will tell you, and I think most of the academics in the room would agree, teaching has very little impact, uh, particularly at research universities, at, as to how tenure is um, uh, awarded. Uh, number five, students should receive a personalized learning contract, just promising what the school would deliver. That would allow the student evaluation to be more accurate. Uh, number six, legislative appropriations should go directly to students in the form of scholarships, not given to the schools to spend as they want. And number seven, that we should support an alternative accreditation not replace the original, the existing, but an alternative consumer's report style to give us better information and better feedback for parents and students than U.S. News and some of the rankings. So those were the seven solutions that were presented at a public meeting. And, you know, three or four years ago, and kind of everything died down. And then the governor and several regents decided to get serious at least about one of these, which was let's publish data that is already should be by law publicly available. And I'll tell you, that is when I saw the most vicious PR firefight I have ever seen in my life. So keep in mind at this point, nothing had been done. No laws passed, no rules, simply a request for data. I had reported by several people close to the process that um, people inside the administration uh, at, at one of these schools said, I know that data is public. I will not collect it and release it because it would destroy the university because the average person doesn't understand what we do here. I would hold if that's true, it is the university's responsibility to explain it so the average parent and taxpayer like me does understand what they do here, but that there is no excuse for holding data in a non-transparent way and not, re and not releasing data to be analyzed. So it caused this massive PR effort uh, demonizing TPPF, uh, Rick O'Donnell, 
Rich Vetter, uh, to a certain extent myself, uh, for attacking research universities. Never were UT and A&M mentioned um, in, in, in the original seven solutions. Uh, so this was just meant as a framework for discussion. It did lead to data being published. It did lead to a violent uh, reaction from the university that, as per the press release, uh, continues even today. Um, attacking Rich Vetter for comments that he had not made at the point of time that the press release was written, which strikes me as rather odd. Uh, how they could know that you were, in fact, going to say something this morning um, is, is, strikes me as, as odd. Um, so just one last comment on, on the data itself, um, which I think is really interesting. And the data is pretty clear, actually. You can get this. This is available, available publicly. I would encourage people to get the spreadsheets. Uh, with about 15 minutes of Excel, you can do data sort and look at all sorts of different cuts on the data yourself. Uh, don't take my word for it or Rich's word for it or anybody's word for it. Look at the data. Uh, the data shows, and I'm going to use UT Austin here, not picking on UT Austin. It happens to be the first data set and the one I have. It's available on A&M and the other UT and A&M system schools. But at UT Austin, you see clearly there are three casts of teachers. Good, bad, or indifferent. This isn't a matter whether you like the fact there are three casts. It isn't a matter but there are three casts. And we've already heard them spoken about today earlier. There are the dedicated teachers, the adjuncts, people like me that taught for a number of years at a fairly low cost and taught most of the students. If you look at the group that are the most efficient teachers, meaning lowest cost per student taught at UT, the 1,000 most efficient teach on average for $46,000 a teacher. That's the income. They teach an average of 37 students a class, so not large classes. I taught a number of 40 student classes. That's very manageable in most cases. They taught on average 220 students a year, actually not a very large number of students. And if this group taught all of an undergraduate degree, including overhead, you could deliver an undergraduate degree for about $12,000 total. So these are very inexpensive teachers teaching as adjuncts mainly. And they brought in about $26 million of funded research, so there are clearly some traditional academics. There's a second group, and this was the most surprising thing to come out of the data. And they are, and Jamie's one of the people here that would, would be in this second group. Because what you find that's shocking is there's a group of super researchers. 90% of the external research money brought in the university is brought in by 10% of the faculty. Now, let me be clear. I am all for research. I'm an engineer. I've used research. Research is great. So anybody that runs out and says I'm anti-research isn't telling the truth. In fact, I think what we should do is change the incentives so we get more people like Jamie from California and Washington and anywhere else to come to Texas. I'm all for taking productive researchers and, and giving them incentives to bring more of them. I think it's a terrific idea. So let me be clear on the record there. The problem is there's a third group the least productive, and I call this the political professoriate, which may be a little um, uh, inflammatory, but I'm talking about people who do neither much funded research or much teaching. This group, oh, by the way, the super researchers on average make 164,000 people like Jamie, teach seven students a class, about 112 students a year, and the teaching's free because, as Jamie pointed out, they pay for themselves. So. The teaching comes as a free good along with all the research money Jamie brings in. Contrast that with the political professoriate, the least productive, who make on average $155,000 a year, about as much as Jamie's group. They teach about seven students a class. They only teach 44 students a year. So despite bringing in almost no funded research, they teach a third the number of students that someone like Jamie teaches. and. If you take those numbers out, the implied cost of an undergraduate degree would be not $12,000, but $406,000. Now, be clear, I'm not saying the humanities are bad. I'm not saying we shouldn't write research papers. That's not the point. That's not for me to decide. I do think the disparity in workloads and cost per student and cost per degree is something that deserves being looked at by scholars and policymakers and parents and taxpayers. I just think that the data ought to be out there and looked at and that, it's, that it's, it's worth looking at. There is a transformation coming in education with all the new blended learning that's going to put tremendous pressure. So we want our universities to survive and prosper. We're going to need to find new ways for them to come, become both higher quality, because I don't think the teaching quality is nearly what it should be, and more efficient at the same time. We're, we're going to have to have both. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>